we're starting a new series. Uh, the series is entitled My Spiritual Journey. I'll explain more about that in a couple of minutes. I want to kind of begin by doing a reading from a little book I use in the morning called For Today. It's my daily meditation book for, my, for eating disorders. May 15th. Pray to God, but continue to row the boat to shore. Russian proverb. God is not my arms and legs. It is up to me to do the footwork. Ours is a program of action. The first two steps require reflection and contemplation. The rest call for direct action. Of course, I do not work a perfect program. When I feel rebellious, as I sometimes do, then I pray to be willing, putting myself and my stubbornness into God's hands. Out of all programming, I still need to be perfect, for I can like myself. But God has infinite and unconditional love for me and gives me everything I need, including the willingness to take action. All I have to do is ask for the help. For today, God will do for me what I cannot do for myself, not what I can do for myself. I like that. I wanted to read that because we're going to start a little three-week series, actually a four-week series, on called My Spiritual Journey. I want to put this together because I had the wonderful opportunity of writing a book about a lot of stories of my life, things that have happened to me over the course of the past 84 years called My Spiritual Journey. But I want to put it into a lecture form because one of the things I believe in very importantly is that each and every one of us, uh, um, again, it's just a suggestion, we should take the time to actually go down and write our history. Because each and every one of us is unique. We all have a story. And our story is the only one there is of, the, of us on the face of this earth. And what I have found over the years as I got older, begin to realize to write that story, to put it together, to look how God plays a part, my higher power, in the journey. As I went on back and did a lot of research, I really began to realize, and again, a lot of this stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, I was able to do because I spent time in therapy. I spent time in doing research. And literally, I was able to go back and look at my childhood and begin to understand all the beautiful things I learned from the aspect of my childhood. What I want you to try to do for yourself is look at patterns. I ask the question, why am I on this earth? And it's amazing how each and every one of those patterns was developed inside of us so that eventually they could become teachable moments and they can once again bear fruit. I didn't think this way before because I spent a lot of time in my childhood, you know, without a voice. I spent a lot of time angry. I spent a lot of time even in my young adult years until I began to realize Everything that happened to me was a teachable moment and there was a purpose behind it. So I was open to learn from it. I want to start the story a little bit of my early years that I'm doing tonight by going back to the year 1896. That's not my birth year, by the way. Okay, John, remember that. Okay, 1896 is the year my father was born. And what I find so interesting about developing patterns about your life, I realized that my father, by coming into this world and beginning his journey, was actually getting ready for me to start my journey. So I'm back into some research. I noticed my father was born from a very poor family over in Italy. He was conscripted into, into the war, the First World War. He served four years in the Italian cavalry. Literally, literally saved his money. And when he got out of the army, he basically was told by his parents they had arranged for him to take a journey to America and basically they have found a wife for him in America. Now, you got to realize coming out of a poor family, looking for some kind of security, this was a great chance for my father to begin his journey. And so listen to his family and did what his family told him. He got on a boat, came to this country, and landed 
somewhere around, we're not sure how exactly, but somewhere around um, 1920 and landed in Baltimore and they gave him a job on the railroad. And my mother, he had my mother's name tagged with him who couldn't speak English. Her address was in Camden, New Jersey on his chest. And basically he worked his way on the railroad land track and took him seven months living on a work train to make it up to Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, he was able to get a sponsor who sponsored him. And then basically he went over to meet my mother. And basically the journey for the two of them began. Before I get into that though, let me go back and look at my mom. How things, how patterns work in life and how they come together. My mother was born in 19... 1900, at least 1904. My mother's mother died when she was two years old. My mother and her sister were placed in the St. Vincent's Orphanage for the next five years. Because in those days, men didn't raise children. So my grandfather dropped them off for the nuns to raise till they could find a new wife and go back and pick them up. And so she spent five years in an orphanage and basically... Later on, her father came and got her and told her that as she got ready, she was going to be married and told her the man she was going to marry. Everything was prearranged, nice little packages all put together. So in 1922, both my parents got married at a Lady Mount Carmel Church in Camden, okay, on December 2nd. And the beautiful part about that concept is they were they came together. And then for the next 18 years, we don't really know what occurred because nobody talked about things back in those days, especially in the family. It was what I call the land of secrets. Finally, my mother conceived me and I was born on May 24th in Cooper Hospital in 1940. Now, I know I joke a lot. Sometimes I say, I don't know what they did for the first 18 years. Who knows? You know, basically, a lot of things could have happened. But if you know much about Italian families back then and families in general, not just Italians, others too, nobody talked about anything. Everything was kept secret. And so being born, coming into that family, I began my journey. But it's interesting how everything had to bring them together to get to a point where I will be born. My birth was tough. My mother had me cesarean birth and almost died on the operating table. And so it really was kind of a traumatic situation for me as it was for her. But with the grace of God, everything kind of worked out and the journey began. I was joined into a very interesting and a very beautiful Italian family living in South Camden, which was the extension of South Philadelphia. And I don't know what that's all about. The concept is the two places kind of merged. That's where the, many of the immigrants met. And when we think about the craziness of the Italian family, definitely you heard that term, it takes a family to raise a child. Well, it's true. The only problem is my family basically had no boundaries. Basically, we all lived in the same neighborhoods. We all knew each other's business. Everybody had their nose in everybody else's stuff. You had no privacy. And so it really was like a menagerie. But again, that was normal back then. We're looking at normals. You know, parents placed me into what, what a group of cousins who became really my, my surrogate you know, brothers and sisters. And basically, we had a large family, except for my mom and dad. Everybody else had a lot of kids. And as a result, then, basically, that became the family. My family had its issues, like all of our families did. That's why I always emphasize those first 10 years of your life teach you a lot about yourself as a person. In those first 10 years of my life, I didn't have a voice. Some of the rules I learned, many of you learned, and that was... Little kids should be seen and not taught, and they should not be heard. And as a result, basically, you went along with the program, and everything was planned for you. 
and your life was planned out. Were you angry? Probably, I don't know. You weren't allowed to feel angry because you, you needed to obey. And that was reemphasized in, in, in grammar school, in the church circles. Everything was centralized around the church in our community, just as it was in Italy. And as a result, literally, it was a place where basically a lot of emphasis was placed. Also at the same time, my mother, and I understand it all now, as I look back on patterns, I realize my mother basically uh, got abandoned by her mother, got abandoned by her father. And when I was born, I would never get abandoned. In fact, it went to the extreme and my mother smothered me, overprotected me, guarded me, like somebody was going to grab me and escape with me, I don't know. But literally I was overprotected. And as a result then basically, I never really had what you would call a normal childhood. In the school system, once again, you were taught, be quiet, listen, or else. And we all know what the or else was back then. And as a result then, literally everyone told you who you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to do it, and how you're supposed to do it. As a result then, they became the patterns in life. And those patterns literally lead you to different areas of life. For example, I realized today, and I tell my mother's story, my mother was a prescription drug addict, but I looked at the, her history. I realized now my mother worked for Camel Soup. So I visualized this, and many of us would not be able to do this. She worked for 35 years in Camel Soup, and she worked on the can line. You did the exact same job every day for eight hours. You watched cans go by. And if a can, can was dented, you yanked it off the line. You yanked it off the line. Imagine doing that for eight hours a day for 35 years. All the ladies on the can line used to live on no-dose pills, amphetamines. And of course, they became addicted to them. But it was a normal way of life. And addiction was a normal way of life. The same thing on the other side. My father made the wine, the food, everything. Everything was centralized around eat, drink, be merry, party, this stuff, everything else back and forth. And there was a lot of good stuff in there too, a lot of beautiful stuff. I also realized the fact that families had their issues. And one of the beautiful issues in our family was we had two sides to it. My mother planned and gave me her addictive personality. I picked up my addictive personality, my compulsive behavior from her, because she also was a food addict, as well as I can still visualize her in her moo dress with her sneaks cut out in the front. She was a pretty large woman. And also, I also visualize a lot of things in my life today that were part of my journey. But one thing I realize is, and I realize it today, my mother tried her best. She gave what she could. And she looked at me as something very precious and literally, literally tried to take care of me all the time. And the interesting thing is because of all that, I realized today so many things I learned. But here's the thing I have to look at I want to share with you. It's like we have to go through things to get to the other side, to go back to appreciate. Even the nuns, the educational system, I'm grateful to them today. Why am I grateful? At least they taught me good orderly direction. They taught me structure. They taught me discipline. They taught me that basically you had to have some kind of order in your life. And as a result, I'm grateful for that today. Do I like the way they did it? Of course not. But at least I learned something from it. You can grow from everything you go through in life. It's all part of the journey. It's part of the learning experience. And I realize now how why my parents were. My father also was probably won the award for codependent of the year. He's a man who did everything for everybody. He was a great cook. He made his own food. He killed his own pig, made his own sausage, you know, his own peppers, everything else. The backyard was like a, a big garden. Everything we had the house where the peppers hung, all that kind of stuff. A lot of those that I'm talking about. But basically, it was it was like, I don't know, I lived in camel soup at home, too. It smelled like camel soup every day. And as a result, then, everything was done based around food, based around 
uh, wine based around alcohol. It was normal. And as a result, you grow up in that kind of an atmosphere. You also grow up in an atmosphere where there's two sides. My father was, was a good guy. My mother was the addict. My father took care of her, he a great caretaker, did everything for everybody. I picked up my, my traits from my father. Believe me, I did. And I picked up my traits from my mother. We all do. And I realized that. You know, and I always kind of tell some stories because I like stories. But I go back into those days and you realize we lived in a closed community where everything was in walking distance. We didn't need any cars, transportation. We didn't need, you know, access link or anything. Everything was right there, the corner grocery store, the corner everything. You know, the, the, where they go, you pick up the chickens, you know, the, 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 everybody came to you, to your house, the milkman, everything else. Everything was connected together. It was like a big community. But one thing was interesting, you never went outside the community, you stayed in the community. You only dated Italians. I'm sure the Irish only dated Irish. I was talking to somebody today about that. You stayed within your own. There were the rules, the regulations you lived by. And again, there's a negative part to that. There's a positive part to that. It was almost like teaching us survivor skills. You know, people always ask me this question. I say, how can you be from Camden, New Jersey and be a Yankee fan? How come you're not a Phillies fan? or an A's fan. Why are you a Yankee fan? Well, I gave them a simple explanation. When I was a young kid in Camden, we realized everything was centralized about being Italian. So all the players on the Yankee team back then were Italian. And so therefore, Italians root for the Italians. So therefore I became a Yankee fan, isn't that amazing? I even got to do Dream Week with them later on. That story will come in another part of this. The bottom line is, I realized over and over again, many of our, our, our traits, characteristics, and things are developed as a result of it. And as a result, then everything was centralized around simplicity. I was able to do things you can never do today. I remember as a kid, my father worked on the railroad. My mother worked in camel soup. So they needed a babysitter. My father would take me to the railroad yards. In those days, you had the old steam engines. You had what they called the shifter engine. Never left the yard. It would shift cars all day long and line them up for the big engines to pick them up. So my father would put me on the engine, and the engineer was my babysitter for the day. I spent eight hours driving back and forth on a steam train five days a week. I had my little shovel, my little piece of coal I could put in one thing at a time, and I came home. Well, I knit in the bath because I was filthy dirty when I came home. But that was my life. Things you can't do today. But back then, all these things were normal. They were great experiences in one way or another. But at the same time, there was also a lot of heartache because of world wars, depression, a lot of hurt, a lot of struggle, a lot of stuff that people went through. And even in our neighborhood. You know, there was a lot of my mother's side of the family. There was a lot of, you know, off-color stuff taking place. My mother booked numbers. Basically, my family did. Everybody did back then. I even booked numbers back then. When I was eight years old, I used to pick the number slips up from the grocery store. I didn't know what I was doing. I was told, go pick the groceries up. So I went and picked the groceries up. I didn't know I was carrying number slips and do all that kind of crazy stuff. But again, that was the world we lived in back then. That was the world that developed me. That's the world in which I learned. And it's interesting how so many of your patterns and traits and things are developed in that world. You heard me talk a lot about adjustment. I learned that way back then. You know, I remember the leader of the, um, the so-called mob, whatever they called it back then, was a gentleman named Marco Riginelli. And... He was big at our parish in Camden, Lady Mount Carnal, and basically donated a lot of money to the parish. And we'd have processions where they used to carry the statues around the street, and there's a lot of tradition. And he also would always carry the statue, and because they saw him, of course, then people made sure they put money on the statue. And that was uh, the, I mean, it sounds crazy and insane, 
But uh, all these traditions, all these things were part of it. You know, on Good Friday and Holy Saturday, you know, and the church, they would have the cross with flowers around it for the crucifixion for three hours in the afternoon. And they locked the church up and they take the cross down and they had a statue of Jesus laying in the tomb. Then they put them up front. We'd have the wake from six o'clock at night till nine o'clock at night. They had the viewing, you know, and then another service after that. Everything was enacted. It was always like the constant process. It was something people connected with. It was community. It was family. Was it dysfunctional? Yeah. Was it a little crazy sometimes? Yeah. The statues were heavy carrying them up and down the steps. The bottom line was we had a sense of family. I, I learned so much from that. I connected with it. Even the ways in which people dealt with things in life. Because again, I realized that people go through struggle. They learn how to, how to survive, how to adjust to things. So a lot of adjustment would take place in the process of this. So we learned how to adjust to the times, to adjust the situations in life. You know, and I, I always learned over and over again that everything is not black and white. So when Marco Bruginelli died, he left a lot of money to the church. But the bishop said he was not allowed to be have the mass in the church and be buried in the Catholic cemetery because he was considered notorious. But the Italians, what can I tell you? were a little strange, you know, Father Mike made adjustments. So instead of bringing them in the church, they opened the front doors of the church. They had them on the street. They didn't bring him in. It was out and we could see him right from the altar. And so literally he was there, but he wasn't there. They had the mass, they had everything. They went out on the street and blessed him. Then they took him to Fort Harley Cemetery by Lord's Hospital. Then three o'clock in the morning, they moved him to Calvary Cemetery, the Catholic Cemetery. That's where he's buried now. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? It's called adjustment, acceptance, adjustment. Instead of getting all bent out of shape, we learned how to adjust the situations in life. That was a great lesson for me to learn, to be able to handle situations, how to be able to be open to them and to realize a lot of funny things took place too, you know. I remember as a kid, I loved being an altar boy because you got to serve the funerals. And they always gave you a quarter when you served the funeral. In fact, that was a lot of money back then. So basically, I couldn't believe it, I got a quarter. But then I go back to school and sister would take it from me and put it in the poor box. It's totally amazing. Uh, you know, it was crazy. But we had, we, had, we had an undertaker named Antonio Mecca. You know, he was a little, a little strange, but he was character as everybody's characters back then. And I remember being serv serving funerals and I was standing there by, by the casket and this lady was screaming and yelling because her husband had died. Because back then we have what we call professional criers. You would hire four ladies to cry at your funeral. Amazing. All dressed in black, screaming, yelling, crying, carrying on. But the wife was carrying on too. And of course, back then they lowered the caskets into the ground. So when they were getting ready for that, she jumped on top of the casket and straddled it. And she said, I'm never going to let you go. Antonio Mecca said, lower it. As the caskets start going down, it's interesting. She got off quickly. But the bottom line was, I was laughing my head off as an altar boy. I had, I had to be careful how I didn't laugh too much out loud. That was just the funny part of stuff. He looked at life in different ways. There was a sense of humor. And yet, at the same time, there was a lot of areas where you literally were never allowed to have a voice to say. Everything was planned for you and developed for you. What I'm learning is I'm older now, and I've done a lot of work in therapy. I've done things in different directions. And recovery has helped me tremendously through the steps to realize what lessons did I learn from all this? Instead of spending my life looking at it negatively, I'm learning to accept the fact that these were patterns and things were developed in my life. And they began my journey. And it's interesting, I truly believe this. I mean, I look at the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and the founders, Dr. Bob and Bill W. The two of them 
were two very interesting characters. I mean, they had a lot of problems, and yet they came together, and they tried something. And as a result, look at what came out of it. I still joke about this today. I say, I know they had to be divinely inspired because you had a group of 39 drunks who got together at the first convention and put together the big book. They put together the 12 and 12. You know God had to have some role in that. Because you're putting 29 recovering people in the room. Good luck. But the bottom line is, and you know, you, you see some of that stuff going on today. And yet something beautiful was born. And I really believe things happen because there are patterns that lead you to them. Things take you in that direction. And I really believe that the higher power has actually chooses us to be the people that we are. Because if we go back and look at our history and look at who we are and where we're coming from, we realize the fact that we're all molded and developed in the course of our life. I mean, was there, this, I mean, yeah, I can look at a lot of stuff and say, yeah, my parents sure won the prize for dysfunctionality. Things were crazy, and yet they were beautiful at the same time. You know, I still, to this day, you know, I had relatives, I didn't even know their names. Every time they came in and out of the house, I'd say to my father, who's that? That's your guma, that's your goomba. I must have had a thousand gumas and a thousand goombas. Now I know what that really means today, but I'm not going to get into that. But the bottom line is, there's all kinds of little ways in which we look at things and connect with things in life. And words, and simple little things. But my mom and dad started the journey together, and they sent me on a journey. Did I have a voice? No. Was it decided for me what I was going to do? Yes. And yet, what's so beautiful about it was, that definition would take me to the next stage in my life. And then that would take me to another stage. And I look back on it now as I look at it through history and through learning. And I realize and I emphasize this to everybody in this room. I recommend take time to do your history. Take time to go back and look at your foundations and your basics. The foundations of where you come from, where your parents came from, where your grandparents came from, the traditions, the things, the things we learned. You learn so much about yourself and do so much growing. You can even learn how to look at life through a different set of eyes. I know, even my mom, one of, one of the funny stories that my mom was, my mom would do the grocery shopping every week, you know, because you did everything by the week. You didn't have a lot of good refrigeration back then because you had the old icebox. Charlie knows what an icebox is. But there's an old icebox where basically there was no electric, so you had ice on top, and it would melt down, keep things, and you have to empty the pan all the time. Constantly empty the pan. The ice man would come, bring the ice. And the bottom line was, my mom would go shopping on a, you know, every week. And then we had a man across the street, Saint Miguel, who was sick in a wheelchair. My mom would shop for him and take care of him. And so she went shopping one day and she was out shopping. And I figured she went to Saint Miguel to get the list and everything. When she came back, she was taking her, putting her groceries away. And I said to my mom, I said, how's Sir Miguel? She said, he's dead. I said, what, what? She said, he's dead. I said, well, I'll over get the shopping list from him and he was dead. I said, well, did you call the family? Not yet. She put in the groceries or what? I said, well, why not? I'm going to get my grocery shopping done first. And she couldn't understand why I was upset. She said, what's, what's the matter? She said, he'll be just as dead an hour from now as he is now. But I bring that up for a reason, because they looked at life in those very simple terms. There was a beginning, there was an ending. There's things you learn, you grow from. And there was they were accepting of that. And again, I, I know my mom, the reason why she did it was because she didn't want to miss all the excitement when she called the family and everybody was around. And then we're going to start, you know, all that. and there'll be plenty of food too. We're going to, here we go again, the whole thing would start. The bottom line is, you know, memories, things that come into your mind that help you to learn about yourself and grow. That's why I call them the early years, because I really feel that forms are taking place inside of you in those first years of your life. 
I picked up my codependent behaviors, a lot of things that would affect me later on in my life from my father. I picked them up from my mother. I picked up my compulsive personality. I picked up my mind towards addiction, different things in different directions. I picked up stress, anxiety, and even picked up a lot of shame. There's two sides to everything. And I realize now as I look back, all those things make up who I am and make up my story. And I've learned over and over the importance of owning your story. And the more you own your story, the more you look at yourself, the more you learn about yourself and you begin to realize the great lessons you can learn from life. You know, I'm going to lead into this, you know, next week when I talk about the priesthood. But my mother and my mother made a decision, was her decision, just like your parents made decision for them what they were going to be married. So a decision was made for me. I was going to be the family priest. My mother loved that idea because in her eyes, I'd be protected, especially from the, I think from, I think they're called females. I'd be protected. I'd be protected from a lot of things in the world. And as a result then, when I was 14 years old, I was told I was going to go to the seminary and become the family priest. Now, did I want to be a priest back then? I don't know what I wanted to be. I followed the rules. I followed the guidelines. I was a good boy. I did what I was told. And as a result then, it had some nice positive things to it. When I told the nuns I was going to the seminary and took the test to go in the seminary, it's amazing how overnight, I'm a C student, by the way. Overnight, I became an A student at the classroom. Isn't it wonderful? What you got to do is go to seminary. You become an A student overnight. You know, I don't even know what happened. Never got a report card like that before. But the bottom line was, all of a sudden, you're the hero. All of a sudden, you're the one that's going to go. You're the one that's going to do this. And especially, it was big in my parish because we had never had a priest ordained from my parish in Camden. So if I stayed and went through it, I'd be the first one. And so a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stuff. Was I scared? I was scared out of my mind. I'm really be told when you're 14 years old, you're going away. And pack your bags, here we go. You know, and I remember, because the first seminary I went to was in a place called Bloomfield, Connecticut, right outside of Hartford, Connecticut. I went there for three years. And I didn't know anybody, anything. I thank God to this day. For a very special gentleman. His name was Benny. He was my roommate. And I thank God for him because I don't know if I could have been able to even learn how to do the normal functions of life and things to do if it wasn't for him. I'm grateful. I got put into a room with someone who was older than me, who took me under his wing and helped me in very many ways. God took care of that also. And then after three years in Connecticut, they changed us and they moved us because, now I got to be honest, one of the reasons they shipped us back here is because we got into a lot of trouble in Bloomfield, Connecticut. We're high school kids who would sneak out at night to a place called the Greasy Spoon. It was the high school hangout. And we would go and make believe we were high school kids. Of course, they knew. We came from the seminary. But we climbed windows, sneak out at night, and we finally got caught. And the bishop decided to get us out of there and brought us up here. And we went to Mother of the Savior Seminary for the next three years in Blackwood, New Jersey, where Camden County College is right now. That was a seminary back then for kids that were coming from grammar school. I spent three years there. And it's just interesting how that journey takes you in different directions. We begin to see different things. But I'll get more into that when I talk about the priesthood next week and the aspect, the journey, the journey that took me to different places and different things in the course of my journey in life. But it all goes back to the roots and the foundations. I know now that this all is something that God had in mind because he brought my parents together. He brought me into the world. Every one of us in this room has a story Yes, 
Many of us came from crazy dysfunctional families, but that's okay. They were supposed to be. What lessons did we learn? Why are where we are today? Who are we today? Go back and look at your history, look at things, connect with them the best you possibly can. Do some research, find out where things come from. Go back and look at your parents. You know, I, I was just going through, I have a, a, a family album here. I went through it last week looking for pictures of my mom to put on Facebook. And as I went through it, my God, I had tears in my eyes. All the pictures in that book are from my family from back then. And I realized there aren't too many of us left right now. I was look, looking at a book of photographs of people who have passed on. And so it brought back a lot of memories, but also a lot of sadness too. Because the journey of life goes on. And it's all part of it. And yet I realized today, I don't mind talking about my history. I don't mind talking about the journey. I'm grateful for it. And I am extremely grateful for the people who had the courage to work with me and help me through my journey, especially in recovery, which I'll talk about in the third of the series. You know, I was able to put some of this stuff into writing and wrote a book about it. But you only put so much in a book. You can't put a lot of things in a book that you really, you know, don't belong there. They belong in recovery. They belong in the rooms. And that's okay, too. And yet I realize more and more today, you know, the more I learn about myself, the more healthier I become, and the more I'm beginning to realize the journey. So look in the mirror tonight and ask yourself a question. What's your story? Where did you come from? What are your roots and your foundations? Each one of us is unique. Each one of us is special. Each one of us has a story. And I don't care what the story is. For you, that's the greatest story on the face of this earth. I have said this so many times on my journey. The greatest library on the face of this earth is the human library. It's the stories of people. You know, I tell this to my interns all the time here at Starting Point when they're starting out. I tell them, you're now ready for your real, real learning experience. The books are great. All the theories you learned in class are wonderful and great. But now you have to meet people. The real teachers are now on their way. And every person that you meet is now a teacher. You're going to learn from them and grow from them. And then Tim came up to me quite a while ago and said to me, you gave me this client. I don't know what to do with him. I, I really wanted to do therapy and try to work with him and see what I could do. But all he wants to do is talk. I can't get a word in edgewise. I said, well, maybe that client was given to you so you can learn how to be a listener. Maybe that's the only lesson you have to learn. He said, well, he's been through all kinds of therapy his whole life. I said, just listen. Maybe the man just needs somebody to talk to once a week. Tell him to go to all the different meetings at our place. Tell him to learn, meet people, get social, do all kinds of stuff. And so she gave him nine meetings to go to. He went to the meetings, he did all that kind of stuff. And about six months later, he came up to me. He says, you know what? He's got friends now. He's enjoying life. He's having a lot of fun. He still comes in. I've got to listen to him once a week. But basically... He's a lot, it's a lot different now. I said, see, you just did therapy. Congratulations. But the therapy wasn't him. It was you. What did you learn from him? He was sent into your life to be your teacher. That's why the human library is so important. And that's why it's important to be open to it. Nobody comes into our life by accident. I'm convinced of that today. And whatever we went through, we went through. The secret is, am I willing to be open to learn from it, to grow from it? Am I willing to acknowledge my history and be able to embrace it? So I share my early years with you because I now I can look back on them and now I can see them with a different set, set of eyes. I'm grateful, you know, to have that childhood. I'm grateful for every instant of it. And what was it? Was it, was it crazy? Yeah. Was there a lot of crazy stuff involved in it? Sure. You know, stuff I, some stuff I can't even say in the air. But the bottom line is, 
It was history. It was life. And I thank mom and dad every day with gratitude and with love for bringing me into the world. I thank them for who they were. I look at my parents. I have photographs out here of them all the time. I look at them, you know, and I'm grateful.